Okay. Okay, folks. So uh, we move on to part two of the lecture on variational autoencoders. Uh, interrupt me. Ask questions, clarifications, anything. This is what, this is uh, uh, again the first time I'm doing this lecture, so there are going to be all kinds of issues, and so questions and clarifications are going to be particularly helpful. Try to ignore that horrible squeak. That's from my uh, uh, smoke alarm, which is trying to make me deaf. Anyways, so here's a quick recap. This is what we saw in the last class. We saw in the, in the in previous lectures, we saw how neural networks can perform classification and regression tasks, how they can generate distributions from Boltzmann data from Boltzmann distributions. And then we began the series of two lectures on variational autoencoders where neural networks are to be considered as generic generative generative models, which can model the distribution of uh, pretty much any kind of data, such that we can draw samples from these data. Uh, from these data. So uh, in the last class, uh, first we'll spend a few minutes going over what we did in the last class. So in the last class, we, we defined what a generative model was. In statistical estimation, a generative model is a functional or computational model for the probability distribution of a given data. So uh, it's a model. It has parameters. You can represent it generically in this form that I'm showing with my uh, with my pointer. Can you see the pointer, guys? Yep, you can see the pointer. So uh, you, you can generically represent it as uh, p of x semicolon theta. This semicolon theta is meant to indicate that it has parameters theta, and sometimes we won't actually write the semicolon theta, but it will it will be implicit. Now this is this is a model for how for the uh, distribution of the data. It, generally has underlying it a story, a generative story for how the data are produced. Now, uh, these kinds of models have various uses. They can be used to compute or estimate the probability of observing a specific value x. They can also be used to generate samples that are statistically similar to whatever data you're modeling. We saw some examples of generative models. A Gaussian, for, the, for example, is a generative model for the distribution of some kinds of data which have uh, a roughly bell-shaped uh, distribution. So uh, this is a, a Gaussian is what I call a one-step generative model in that the generative story behind how data are generated from this distribution is you pick an observation from the Gaussian. That's it. There's only one step. Similarly, multinomials. We also saw multinomials. This is again uh, a distribution for for discrete uh, a uh, generative model for discrete data. And once again, the generative story behind uh, the data that's encoded in this model is a one-step generative story. You have a multinomial, you draw a sample from it. But you can have multi-step uh, generating processes that are encoded by your generative model. For example, a Gaussian mixture model models the distribution of your data as a mixture of Gaussians. The generative story behind it is that uh, the data are generated in a two-step process. In the first step, one of the Gaussians in the mixture is selected according to this multinomial distribution PK. In the next step, an observation is drawn from the selected Gaussian, which has its own uh, mean and variance. So that was once one example of a multi-step generating process, generative process, uh, generative model. Here's another one. This is the linear Gaussian models. We sort of briefly mentioned this in the last class. We'll spend more time on it this class. But that is the lower figure here shows your linear Gaussian model. This actually is a generative model that models a Gaussian distribution. But the generative story behind it is, a, is as follows. You first draw a sample from a zero mean unit variance Gaussian. You pass it through this linear transform and then add some additional Gaussian noise to the output to get your, get your observation. Again, this is a two-step process where first you draw Z and then from Z you compute the X hat, which is, which is and then the next step you add this noise E to get the final output. So there's a two-step process. The generative model is just a model. In order to make it actually represent the distribution of a data, 
the parameters of the model have to be adjusted such that they best, uh, the model best represents the data. So the parameters of the model must be estimated from observed data. The way we will do it is we want the model to assign high probabilities to events that you see frequently in your training data and low probabilities to events that you see infrequently. So we encode that using this maximum likelihood principle where we compute the probability of the training data as given by the model and we try to estimate the parameters of the model to maximize this probability or alternately and equivalently to maximize the log probability of the data. And if your training data comprises a lot of independently drawn samples, then this is simply going to be the sum over all of the samples of the log of the probability assigned to individual samples by your model. This is the term that is going to be maximized uh, with respect to theta. So when you do that, you expect to sort of, uh, in the multinomial case, you expect to find a histogram which sort of mimics the, uh, find a multinomial distribution which sort of mimics the histogram of the data that you observed. Or if you are trying to, trying to model some continuous value data with a Gaussian, you expect to find Gaussian parameters such that the Gaussian you end up with roughly mimics the shape of the histogram of the data that you've got and assigns higher probability to more frequent events. Now, the ML estimation principle is fairly straightforward, except when you run into situations like the ones on the slide, when you have to estimate the model from incomplete data. So in many situations, you end up with uh, data which are missing some information. You might be missing some components of the data, like in the figure on the top, where all of these blackened components of a collection of vectors is missing. Or you might be missing some inside information about how the data are generated. So uh, if you have a model like the uh, mixture Gaussian below, the generating process is a two-step process. In the first step, a Gaussian is drawn. In the next step, an observation is drawn from the Gaussian. So if the entire generating pro generative process were a glass box process, then anytime you saw an observation, you would also see the entire sequence of steps that was used to generate the observation, which meant that you would also see the Gaussian that was used to generate the observation. That's what I'm calling the complete data. Now, when you actually get the data in, in, in a, a real setting, you're not going to, you're not going to be privy to the uh, the the uh, intermediate steps, the actual sequence of steps uh, that the generative model employs to generate this particular observation. And so in that sense, the observation that you got is incomplete. You're missing information about what happened in the process of generating it. And you have to now estimate all of the parameters of the model using only what you observed, which are incomplete data. So in all of these cases, the only thing you can, you can uh, assume you have are the actual data you observed. So the model parameters are go going to have to be uh, optimized to maximize the log likelihood of just the data that you have observed. Now, the problem is that these distributions are better characterized when you actually know the entire data. For example, in the upper example, uh, upper figure, we see examples of data that we believe are drawn from a Gaussian. Now, the Gaussian probability distribution gives you the dis probability for the entire vector. If I'm going to be missing some components of it, I need to derive the probability of just the observed components from the probability distribution for the complete vector. Similarly, over here, uh, if the actual generating process, generative process has a two-step uh, procedure, so if I want to actually uh, characterize this model, uh, the, the, the characterize the probability of any given observation, any given, there I'd have to characterize the entire sequence of random steps that generated the observation. But because the intermediate steps are missing, once again, I'm going to have to compute the overall probability of the observation that I got by marginalizing out the missing components from the data. And so I have to compute my probability distribution from my, my, the parameters of my probability distribution from 
are probability terms where some components have been marginalized out, like in the uh, equation that I'm, in, uh, I'm uh, circling with my laser pointer here. As a result, the maximum likelihood estimator ends up with this situation below, where you're trying to find the parameters that maximize the total probability of the observed data, log probability of the observed data, where the log probability of individual observations is obtained by marginalizing out the missing or the hidden components or information in the data. This gives you the situation where you have a log of a sum or an integral of a probability and uh, minimizing or, or optimizing the log of a sum of ugly functions it doesn't usually have uh, nice solutions. This should be maximizing, I've got to fix it. So again, in the last class, we saw how we can sort of solve this problem by using something called the elbow or an empirical lower bound for the log probability of the data. We found that the, the uh, log probability, oh my, yes, this is, yeah. The log probability of the observed data, which is the log of the uh, joint probability of the observed and missing components with the missing components marginalized out, is lower bounded by this term to the right, where you, instead of marginalizing out the missing components from inside the log, you marginalize out the missing components from outside the log probability of the joint data, of the joint of the missing and observed components. And the particular distribution that you use to marginalize out H can be pretty much anything. And so this is an empirical lower bound. This bound is tightest when Q of H is exactly equal to the conditional probability of H given O. And uh, in fact, when uh, uh, Q of H is exactly equal to H given O, this term, this, this, this bound is so tight that the term to the right simply becomes exactly equal to the term to the left. But more generally, you want Q of H to be as close as possible to P of H given O. And uh, if you do that, then instead of maximizing the term to the left, you could maximize the term to the right, which is the lower bound, and still expect to get a good solution estimate for theta. And we say that we saw that we get a nice iterative maximum likelihood estimator if we maximize this elbow directly, uh, and specifically if this Q of H happens in the in the iterative uh, estimate, if Q of H happens to be the conditional probability of H given O using the current current estimate of the of the model parameters, then plugging that into this to this term here and maximizing that with respect to the, the model parameters gives us uh, an, a solution where in each iteration the probability of log probability of the observations is guaranteed to increase and so we ended up with this auxiliary function which is the expectation of the log of the probability of the complete data by complete data i mean the uh, the combination of the observations and the missing components uh, marginalized out or, or the expectation taken with respect to the conditional probability of the missing components given O and the current estimate of the uh, parameters. So if you define your auxiliary function in this manner and iteratively maximize Q with respect to theta using this little iteration that I've given below, you're guaranteed to increase the log of the probability of your observations with every iteration. So this was the math. But then we also sort of sort of looked at this, tried to get a better intuitive feel for what is going on. And here's what we saw was happening. You would start off with some incomplete data, some missing components like the figure to the left or the figure on top to the right, where the identity identities of the Gaussians that were used to generate each of the observations are missing. So in these cases, what we do is to guess what this missing value might be. Now, the, the point is that this missing value could be anything. So we fill out the vector by filling in the missing components, but we fill it out by filling it in in one of two ways. By explicitly filling the missing component in every possible, with every possible value that it could take, given 
what we have observed. So this means that when we fill it out with every possible value that it can take, then each of the values over here are going to occur in proportion to the probability of that value given the observed component. So every missing, every value for the missing component is going to occur in proportion to P of M given O. So you could either do, do this by explicitly filling out these uh, missing components in every possible way, or instead of doing it, filling it out in every possible way, you could just sort of sample uh, the missing components from the posterior probability of M given O and use those to fill out these missing regions. And once you've done that, you're going to get a collection of complete vectors or complete data that you can use to estimate, re-estimate your model. And uh, this framework works regardless of the kind of problem. Like in the case of the problem to the left, where you're missing components of the data, the framework would work. Uh, or in the case of the problem to the right, where you're missing the identity of the Gaussian that drew the vector, the framework would still work here. You would uh, fill in the identity of the Gaussian in every possible way. And that could be drawn either from P of M given O, or you could apply every possible, uh, or you could expand it out in all ways and each of the values of the hidden uh, missing components is going to occur in proportion to P of M given up. So, and now once you've completed the data, you can go ahead and re-estimate your parameters. That was expectation maximization. Then, now this was supposed to, this, this sets up the uh, basis for what follows. Now, our objective here is to uh, learn about variational autoencoders, which are fairly complex nonlinear models. But to give you an intuition of what's going on, I'd, li I'd like to start with a, uh, a linear model, which does essentially the same job as VAEs uh, when you replace the neural network in a VAE by a linear transform. And so we'll start with the simplest version of a, a linear model that uh, does a similar job, which is principal component analysis. Now, we are all familiar with principal component analysis. PCA attempts to derive a low dimensional representation for data. So you're given a set of data observations like these black dots. And the objective in PCA is to find the subspace represented here by this blue line, such that when you project every data point onto this subspace, the error that you make by projecting every data point onto the subspace, which is or the squared error, which is the sum of the squared lengths of these gray lines, is minimized. Now, once you know, once you do that, then you know that in order to represent the data, you don't need to replicate both x and y coordinates in this particular example. We've agreed upon the blue line. You just need to uh, return the position on the blue line, which is just a scalar. And so, uh, the, because the direction is the same for all of the vectors. So in effect, we are, uh, we've reduced the dimensionality of the data in this example from two down to one. So the problem here is that of finding this principal subspace, such that when you do this, the uh, error that you make by approximating the data as some point on this principal subspace is minimized. And so the way we do it, was to search through all principal subspaces, all, all subspaces, basically all lines in this example, until we find one where the squared, the sum of the squared lengths of these projection errors is minimized. This, there's of course a nice closed form solution to all of this. We're all familiar with PCA, but then it turns out there's also an <coughs> iterative estimator as we saw. Again, the objective over here is to find this vector subspace and the position on the subspace, which is this length z, such that when you project the any data point, the data points onto the subspace, this error, the projection error or the squared projection error is minimized. So there are two components to this. One is the direction, the, the print, the, uh, the uh, 
set of bases for the principal subspace itself. In this case, the principal subspace is just a line. So you just need this direction vector w. The second is this length z over here, which is basically the position on the, the vector representing the position of this x on the principal subspace when it's projected to the closest point. So if you have a collection of training vectors, then you end up with two sets of things you want to estimate. One is this matrix of bases for the principal subspace. The second is the set of uh, position vectors, one for each training instance. And what we really want to find is this basis matrix W and the, and the uh, projection vector Z such that, such that W times Z closely approximates X. This can be solved iteratively using a very simple iterative uh, algorithm. You could initialize W and then find the Z which minimizes the error between WZ and X. Then given the Z, you can find the W which minimizes the error between WZ and X. And you can, you can iteratively uh, repeat these steps until the entire uh, iteration converges. And this is guaranteed to find the principal subspace, although uh, there is uh, although the uh, there is some degree of invariance to the length of these basis vectors because you can always increase the length of the basis vector and shrink the z to to give you the same product of the two. Regardless, this iteration is guaranteed to find the principal subspace, and that means that you can actually use that principal subspace to. Uh, find low dimensional representations of your data. So this we saw in the last class actually represents an underlying generative story. There's a generative story behind PCA. Piece, the PCA actually models the data in this manner. It says, the model says that there's an initial random variable Z which is drawn from a k-dimensional isotropic Gaussian. By an isotropic Gaussian, I mean a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and where the covariance matrix is the identity matrix. And that the Z is passed through a linear transform and where the AZ, where A represents the a set of bases for the principal subspace. And then finally, the output to the output is added a noise where the noise is always orthogonal to the principal subspace. It's a zero mean uh, noise that's orthogonal to the principal subspace. And so every single observation in, the, in your data set is obtained by first drawing some z, passing it through the linear transform, which basically positions it somewhere on the principal subspace, and then adding some orthogonal noise, orthogonal noise to it. So if you look at this, if z is a Gaussian, comes from a Gaussian with a unit variance, then a times z which is the result of passing Z through this linear transform is also a Gaussian, which also has zero mean. And the covariance matrix of A times Z is simply going to be A times A transpose. The noise has some covariance D. The noise is assumed to be uncorrelated to, to Z. So as a result, the, when you add noise, the noise to the output of the linear transform, the resulting uh, distribution actually ends up the this, the uh, distribution of the resulting variable x simply ends up having a variance that's the sum of the variances of x hat and the variance of the noise itself. Now this entire process can be intuitively thought of this way. This linear transform your star operates on data in some k-dimensional space. What it does is to stretch and rotate this k-dimensional plane into a k-dimensional plane in the data space. So here you start off with a k-dimensional plane in a k-dimensional space. This linear transform sort of takes this, basically think of it as a sheet of paper that you're putting, pulling up and putting, holding it in three-dimensional space as an example. And then you stretch and skew it. And so AZ basically transforms this this uh, linear space, k-dimensional space, into a k-dimensional plane in the higher dimensional data space. 
So now when Z has some distribution, some circular or isotropic distribution in the K dimensional space, in the higher dimensional space, it's going to end up with an ellipsoidal distribution on this hyperplane. The purpose of A is to transform this space into this sheet. The uh, fact that the distribution of Z is ellipsoidal over here is a consequence of the fact that Z itself is drawn from a circular distribution in the input space. And once this is done, noise is added to the whole. The uh, samples of Z uh, that you have on this plane, you add noise to it to get your, get your final data. So this means that the overall distribution of the data that's modeled by PCA is Gaussian. You start off with x hat equals a times z, which means that the probability distribution of x hat is simply going to be a Gaussian also with mean zero and covariance, which is a times a transpose. You now add this uncorrelated noise e to it. So you're, since you're summing two Gaussian random variables, the sum is also Gaussian. So the probability distribution of x is also Gaussian. Also, and since both z and e have zero mean, the probability distribution of x is also zero mean. And the covariance of it is a times a transpose, which is the covariance of x hat plus d, which is the covariance of e. And so this PCA basically models the data as having a density that's Gaussian, which lies mostly close to a hyperplane. And, uh, and all of the correlation between the components in the data occur strictly on the hyperplane and all variations orthogonal to the plane are uncorrelated. That is the assumption that the PCA model has. Now we can also see as a result that if I give you, if I fix Z, then I'm fixing X hat. So the conditional probability of X given Z is simply going to be a Gaussian with mean AZ and covariance D. Why is that? If I give fix you fix z, then x hat is fixed. So this first term just becomes a constant, which is a z because z is given. And so x simply becomes this noise e plus a constant, which means that the distribution of x becomes simply the distribution of e with the mean shifted to a z, which ends up being uh, a Gaussian with a, with a mean at a z and a covariance d. So this conditional probability of X given Z is something that we are going to encounter a few times. Now I can estimate PCA using maximum, the PCA model using maximum likelihood, the parameters of the PCA model using maximum likelihood. And the parameters of the model are this linear transform A and the covariance D, where you have the, uh, the constraint that E is going to always be perpendicular to A. Now we know that the probability of any single observation according to our model is given by this Gaussian over here. We just derived it. And so the log probability of, of a collection of your data is going to be the sum over all of the observations of the log of this Gaussian computed at each data instance, which is going to be the log of this term given over here. This is the standard formula for a Gaussian. If I if I maximize this probability with respect to both A and D, and additionally use the constraint that the noise is always orthogonal to this, to, to, to this hyperplane, you'll end up with a traditional solution for, uh, for uh, you'll actually end up with a solution for the principal subspace. So uh, this, uh, and this, and just the usual traditional solution for the principal subspace, so this works. I won't go through the map. This is just to sort of uh, get the idea across that the maximum likelihood solution for the parameters of this generator model will give you the principal subspaces that your regular computation also does. But then, yes, Adwet? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm, I had a question. Uh, the In the PCA model, X hat is the principal subspace, right? And then we are adding the no, noise. A is the principal subspace, X hat is the vector on the principal on subspace. The, yeah, right, right, okay, yeah, I get it. Thank you. Right? So now, in this, you have missing information about, uh, there, there is uh, uh, missing information. You, you have inf when you're trying to estimate the model. Specifically, we don't know what X hat is 
So look at the generator model. The generator model first generates Z, computes X hat. So it finds a position on the principal plane and then adds noise. If somebody were to give you for every vector exactly where on the plane it came from, then, it, then you have the collection of vectors on the plane already. So estimating this plane is going to be trivial. And you can just use that to compute A, and you can also use that to compute D. So by not giving you this one key bit, which is what is X hat, or more, more uh, you, know, you are uh, making the problem really challenging. So, or more generally, because X hat is simply a linear transform of Z, by not giving you this key information, what was the Z we began with, you end up, you end up with a complicated, complicated solution. In fact, if you look at the entire generative process, there are two components that have not been given to you. The first is Z, the other is E, because when you go down the entire sequence of operations needed to compute to, to generate X, you first uh, generated a Z, transformed it, then you generated an E, and then you added the two and gave X. As it turns out, so if you want to have complete data, the complete data should have Z, E, and X. But as it turns out, if you if you know Z and A and you know X, E is, e is irrelevant. So for our purpose, we're going to consider the combination of Z and X as the complete data. So if you knew Z for each X, then estimating A and B is going to be very simple. And here's how we can do it. You have X equals A times Z plus the error. So the conditional probability of X given Z, simply as we saw Gaussian with uh, mean AZ and covariance D. So if I look at the, uh, if I gave you X and Z for every observation, then the, joy, the total probability of my data, log probability of, the, of my data is going to be the sum over all complete data, where each complete data instance is a combination of X and Z of the log of the probability of the complete data, which now P of X given Z is P of X, P of X and Z is simply P of X given Z times P of Z. But because P of Z is not a function of either A or D, I can ignore it. In the case, because, and because uh, the log of the product of two terms simply becomes the sum of their logs and the second term can be ignored. Let me write that down just to uh, explain what I mean over here. We have log of, if I can write this carefully, P of X, Z equals P of X given Z plus log of PZ, right? And if you look at this log of P of, now this PZ term simply ends up be, being uh, this, the probability of selecting any particular Z does not depend on either the linear transform or the noise that you're going to add afterwards. And so this term can be ignored. And so all we really have to do is to maximize the uh, sum over all complete observations of the log of the observed data conditioned on the missing components, Z, right? The, the hidden variable Z. And P of X given Z is a Gaussian. We know exactly what it is. And so if I maximize this with respect to my, my the basis matrix, I'm going to end up with the basis matrix equals uh, X times the pseudo inverse of the collection of uh, hidden values Z here, of missing of the uh, 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 yeah, hidden values Z. Now, again, we are working with complete data. We are assuming that some Oracle came by and for each X, they gave us the Zs. So we are able to reconstruct construct this matrix Z and so we now get a solution. Now this solution becomes feasible if we have Z, but in reality, you don't have Z, it's missing. So the EM solution for PCA did this. You sort of initialize your plane, or rather the basis for the plane. Then for every vector X, you completed the data by 
determining the Z for that data instance by finding where the data instance must be projected on the plane. And then, and so basically, uh, in the case of PCA, because you're assuming that the Z is always orthogonal, the error is, the noise is always orthogonal to the plane. Once I'm given the plane and I'm given a vector, there's only one location on the plane that could have generated the data, that data vector, which means there's a unique value of Z. So for every data vector, you're estimating the corresponding Z. Now you have the complete data vector, uh, the complete data, and using the complete data, you go ahead and re-estimate the plane. And uh, once you re-estimate the plane, you can go back and re-estimate the Z and so on, and you iterate. So this was your PCA model. And, you, and this encodes PCA, uh, you get the iterative solution and for PCA is basically just an expectation maximization algorithm using the Gaussian generative model for PCA. Now, the problem is PCA assumes the noise is always orthogonal to the, to the actual data on the plane. So, for, so uh, you're assuming that you're taking some position on the plane you're, the first step of your generation puts the data on some, some location on the plane, and then subsequently you add noise orthogonal to it. Now, this business of assuming that the noise is going to look completely orthogonal to your data isn't always true. Like we saw, we mentioned in the last class for things like images and uh, audio, the noise can actually look, sound, look like uh, valid images or sound like audio. So this assumption of an orthogonal noise is somewhat kind of bogus, so we've got to generalize the model to permit non-orthogonal noise. So here's what I'm going to do. Instead of saying that the E is always orthogonal to the plane, I'm going to say now E is actually, E can be, the error can be, can lie along any direction. So this is still the same generative model we had for PCA. The one difference change I'm making is that I'm saying that the noise can now be, lie along any direction. If the noise is still uncorrelated to the Z. So the noise that you add, it doesn't depend on where you are on the plane. And so the model says that you first generate some, some random, the, the, the variable Z according to an isotropic distribution, transform it, and then add a full rank noise. Now, once again, this linear transform serves only one purpose. It converts this k-dimensional linear space of Z into a k-dimensional hyperplane in the data space. And so when you draw Gaussian data in the input, input space and you transform it, the Gaussian distribution, the, circuit, the, the, the spherically distributed data in the input space now become ellipsoidally distributed on this hyperplane. And then for each instance, you're going to add a noise, which could be pretty much any direction. So once again, if you look at the probability distribution that this guy encodes, this is going to encode a Gaussian. Because as before, because x hat is az, the probability of x hat is simply going to be a Gaussian, zero mean Gaussian with covariance AA transpose. And because the actual observation is just adding some noise to it, the probability of the observation, the complete probability of the observation P of X is also Gaussian with mean zero. And the covariance is going to be the sum of AA transpose and this covariance T. And also exactly as before, the conditional probability of X given Z is simply going to be this Gaussian with the mean shifted to AZ. So it's a Gaussian with mean AZ and covariance T. Questions here? This is all fairly straightforward. Okay. okay. So the linear, this is what we'll call a linear Gaussian model. The linear Gaussian model is the same as PCA with one constraint eliminated. We are allowing the noise to be uh, to be full rank. So this is a this too is a generative model for Gaussians. And this too assumes that the data uh, have a Gaussian distribution that lies largely on some on a hyperplane with some Gaussian fuzz. And the only correlations are along the hyperplane itself. All variations of the, co of the plane are uncorrelated. So in this example where you have two dimensional data, 
clearly you expect the apron, the, uh, the uh, primary, uh, primary uh, subspace to be this line and you, you and the fuzz is somewhat orthogonal, not orthogonal, but all the uh, uh, variations which are off that line are due to this noise E. Also, also in this three-dimensional case, you'd expect that this primary subspace for the data is the plane which slices this Gaussian and all variations off of it are due to this noise E. So uh, the uh, linear Gaussian model has a, has a model models uh, uh, the distribution of, a, of data as Gaussians in a manner that's very similar to PCA, with one exception, which is that it actually allows the noise to be non-orthogonal. And once again, the thing over here is that for any data vector, the main component, the informative component over here, is assumed to be the point on the plane itself. And so, if you or uh, if you want if you could find this position on the plane for any data vector then you could use the coordinates of that position as a low dimensional representation for the data so let's go back and see how let's go on and see how this small change in the model where i allow the noise to be full rank changes the manner in which we estimate things now, once again, the primary components of the model are this transform A and the covariance of the noise D. And again, we're going to assume that this noise is, is or although it may not be isotropic, we're going to assume that the components of the noise are all orthogonal to one another. So D is diagonal. Now, so we ended up with this Gaussian probability distribution for the data. If I'm given a collection of data instances, then independently drawn data instances, I can do a maximum likelihood estimate of A and D, which is simply going to be to maximize the sum over all of the observations of the log of the probability assigned to individual observations according to this Gaussian. Now, the simple business of adding this plus D over here and assuming that D is not low rank, that D is full rank, means that suddenly, whereas for PCA, we had a nice closed form solution, although we also did have an iterative solution, there is no closed form solution for the more generic linear Gaussian model. So we are sort of, uh, we are sort of stuck with trying to come up with iterative estimates. And the reason for this is that there's missing information about the observation X. As, as, as before, the process of drawing an observation first draws a z, transforms it, and adds a noise. So if you wanted to have the complete story for how the observation was, for, for the observation, uh, for the, for the uh, process of drawing an observation, you would need to know what z was, you would need to know what e was, and x. And as before, again, you don't really need e because knowing z and x and a pretty much gives you E. But you do, you should really have had both Z and X, those are your complete data. And if you actually knew the X, Z for every X, then estimating, estimating the parameters of this model, namely A and D is gonna be very straightforward. So again, the estimation formula really looks very similar to what we had for PCA. Uh, you have X equals AZ plus E, that's our model. I can come up with the conditional probability of X given Z. If, if, if every data vector, for every data vector, we also had this extra information, we had the complete data for every data vector, then the, uh, log, pro the log probability that you would be maximizing is the log probability of the complete data, which is a sum over all data instances of the log of the probability of the complete data instance, which, which includes both X and Z. And as before, P of X given Z, P of X and Z can be written of P of X given Z times P of Z. P of Z is not a function of the model parameters. So the uh, estimation again uh, collapses to the simpler estimation formula where you're summing over, uh, where you're summing over all observations the log of the conditional probability of X given Z. And you could write out this formula. You can, that, that gives you 
uh, the formula at the bottom. This is what you would be maximizing. I'm not actually going over the math. It just turns out that this ends up being a nice quadratic in A and the whole thing has a very easy solution. Uh, I have sort of just shown out the math over here to give you what the, fun, what the actual optimization looks like. I can different, differentiate this guy with respect to A and equate it to zero to solve for A. And when I do that, I end up with this nice closed form formula for A, which is the sum of the outer product of X and Z times the inverse of the sum of the outer product of Z itself over all of the training instances. Similarly, I get another closed form solution for D, which is the form, which is the average of the outer products of X minus A times the outer product of X and Z. Now, all of the, both of these formula are closed, closed form, but they're only possible if you know Z, meaning if you had the complete data. In fact, what we are doing over here is maximizing the likelihood of the complete data, assuming we had the complete data. The problem is you don't have the complete data, it's missing. The observations are incomplete. So we're gonna use EM. Here's what we will do. We will initialize our model somehow, and then we're going to complete the missing information for every data vector. There are a couple of different ways of doing it, as, as I mentioned earlier. One way to do it is to, to extend the observation with Z with every possible value of Z. I could do that and when I complete this data in this manner, you're going to see all possible values of Z that match this given observation X. And moreover, the specific where any given value of Z is going to occur in proportion to P of Z given X. So every one of these guys is going to become, a, in this case, a potentially infinite collection of complete observations. Now, for this, of course, you need to be able to compute. Now, for us to, com to complete the data in this manner, you need to be completing, you need to be completing Z uh, in a manner that is, that is compatible with X. So the Z values occur in proportion to P of Z given X. Now we are completing the data. So which means that we need to know what P of Z given X is so that we can actually construct this complete data set. And for this, we need the conditional probability of Z given X. Now, where does that come from? We saw earlier that P of X is a Gaussian. In fact, the joint probability of X and Z is also going to be a Gaussian. And so P of Z given X, as you will see, is basically going to be a slice of this Gaussian at the particular X that you're given. And a slice of a Gaussian, which is shown by this yellow curve, is also going to be Gaussian. So the, the joint of Z and X is Gaussian. And as you can see from here, the conditional distribution of Z given X is also going to be Gaussian. And specifically, it's going to have this really nasty looking form down here. It's not of relevance to us. It's uh, the formula is there for reference and just to let you know that the whole thing is Gaussian. And so when I complete this data, option one, if I complete, if I fill out Z in every possible way, every value of Z is going to occur in a proportion that is given by this Gaussian formula over here, for which we happen to have a closed form. There's a second way of doing it. And, and uh, once I have that, then I can go ahead and uh, I have a collection of complete data vectors. I can re-estimate my parameters from the complete data. But then here's something interesting that happens. You don't need to explicitly expand the data out at all. You just know that any given for each X, any given value of Z occurs in proportion to P of Z given X. So you can simply take this guy and multiply that by the proportion of the observations which take that corresponding value of Z. So that is to say, I take this term here, which is I've written in parentheses, and I multiply it by the proportion of these complete observations, which take the specific value of Z, which is P of Z given X. And I, I 
I can just take a proportional sum or in this case, because it's a continuous value variable, I can take the integral with respect to P of Z given X. And so this term over here is the sum over all observations of the integral or, or the expectation with respect to P of Z given X of this, this uh, uh, log probability term here. And it's this guy that I'm going to be maximizing with respect to the parameters A and D. You can work the arithmetic out. You can, if you, and uh, the math is all over here. It's fairly straightforward. All that happened over here is that in the, in the previous case, in the, uh, when, we, when we looked at this formula, we were summing these terms over complete data vectors. Now here, when I do this, I am instead of explicitly summing over all XZ pairs, I'm considering the actual proportionalities. And so these become expectation terms. All of these are just a consequence of the fact that every single Z occurs in proportion to P of Z given X. The actual formulae again are not needed for us. Uh, the uh, point is that all terms over here integrate over all possible completions of incompletion, incomplete observations where the proportionality attached to any completion of X is P of Z given X. And it gives us a formula, right? If you actually work it out, here are the final formula. So uh, this is when I expanded the data by considering, uh, completed the data by considering every possible value of Z, basically the infinite set. Although I could do it without actually expanding it out to the infinite set, because I know that any possible, any particular value of Z occurs in, in uh, proportion to P of Z given X. There's a second way of doing it. Instead of, instead of filling out the missing value in every possible way, I could sample the, I could fill it out by sampling the posterior probability P of Z given X. So I can draw Z from P of Z given X and use that to complete the data. And now once I've completed the data, I can just go back and use the regular complete data formula because in this case, you know, I actually have a finite set of vectors, uh, complete vectors, and I can use the finite set of complete vectors within the regular, within the usual complete data formula and estimate my parameters. So uh, what is the intuition again over here? The intuition over here is that the linear transform stretches and rotates the k-dimensional input space into a k-dimensional hyperplane in the data space. An isotropic Gaussian in the input space with its spheroidal uh, uh, isoprobability contours becomes an ellipsoidal Gaussian in this in this k-dimensional on this k-dimensional hyperplane. And then uh, so the so and then noise is added to observations over here. So during the generative generative uh, 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 during the in the process of generating observation, the first step takes this value z and places it somewhere on the plane described by a, where the distribution of the point the the locations of z on the plane is also going to be Gaussian. And the second step adds a Gaussian noise to produce points that aren't necessarily on the plane. And you finally get just get this observation. The noise added is not revealed to you. So one of the consequences of this model, which is that which it would say that the noise could be anything, is that if all you observed was this observation, you cannot really be sure where on the plane the data came from. There are many ways of generating the data. For example, you could come here and add this noise, you could come here and add that noise, you could come here and add that noise. Each of these have a different probability. So you can, during the EM solution, during the, uh, e, the EM algorithm, you're given the plane, you're given the observation, you ask yourself the question, where on this plane could this data have come from? And it turns out that it could have come from various locations on the plane, but some locations are more probable than others. So you get a probability distribution for the, put, for the possible locations on the plane from which this guy was generated. And so you're going to essentially attach this point to every single point that it could possibly have come from. And you will get 
many more attachments in the in the more probable areas and far fewer attachments in the less probable areas you would find such atta attached collections of attachments for every one of these observations and just as we saw in the last class i have all of these strings each of them is a tension i release the plane i let it rotate so that the total tension in the uh, strings decreases that is that was your uh, em solution so quickly summarizing lgms LGMs are models for Gaussian distributions. Specifically, the model, the, the distribution of the data is Gaussian, where most of the variation of the data lies along a linear manifold. They do this by transforming a Gaussian random variable Z through a linear transform that transforms the k-dimensional input space to a k-dimensional hyperplane and then adds noise to it. And these things are excellent models for data that actually fit up these assumptions, like these scatters over here. And you can also find, you can, act, you can think of the positions on the plane as the actual underlying, actual underlying data. Everything else that is, as that's being added to it is noise. And so you can actually even compute the probability of different values, true values for any given, given data instance, which is, the prob which is the probability of the values on the plane. So PCA is, fact, is in fact just an instance of LGMs, which makes a constraint as a constraint on the noise. Questions so far? Anybody? So you got Chris, yes? No question. No question, okay, fine. So I went through all of this to give you an idea that, that of this kind of generative model, which is very simple. And we are very familiar with Gaussians. We are familiar with linear transforms. We see how this thing works. Uh, and did the whole thing make sense? The business of filling out information and so on, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so. But this only works for data that actually have this kind of distribution, which lie, which are, which are kind of Gaussian and lie close to a plane. What about data that are not Gaussian distributed or, or that are not Ga or Gaussian distributed close to a plane? Data whose distributions look like these funky things on the top. So in this case, I can still model it as, uh, I can model it as Gaussian on a plane, which has been warped. So you can think of it this way, that you started off with data of this kind, where you had this plane, in this case, the plane is shown by the red line and some Gaussian fuzz. And then this scat, this data, went through some transform which sort of bent the plane into this funky shape on the right and so because every data point bent along with the plane you ended up with the scatter that's shown over here which is the same as the one to the top left so this makes sense the simple uh, yeah. okay and that so if i want to model things this way the prop now this gives me what is called the non, what I call the non-linear Gaussian model. It's not a term you're likely to find in the literature, but you will see why this makes sense. So in order to estimate, if I want to model the, this distribution as the outcome of this process, right? As a first step, I want to find the function that warps this curve, this, 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 this line onto this curve. So this is the non-linear version of the linear transform in the linear Gaussian model. So this one walked a line into this curve in two dimensional space. So more generally, you want a function f that walks a k-dimensional space into some k-dimensional manifold, curved manifold in the data space. And the subsequently, now you can transform, if you have data that are distributed according to a Gaussian, in the input space, if you put all of these data through this transform, they're going to end up as data on this curved manifold because this function is only capable of generating this curved manifold. It takes the input and folds it. So everything that comes out is going to be on that folded curve. And so this Gaussian distributed in the data and in the input are going to be scattered along this manifold. Now it doesn't, there are no, depending on the function, there are no guarantees of symmetry or anything of that kind. So here, for example, you find that the mode of the Gaussian is right here. 
but in my illustration, when you actually walk the space, the mode of the Gaussian is off to the left. All of these guys end up being scrunched close here, and the guys to the right end up being stretched over the rest to over the rest of the plane. The figure is supposed to illustrate the idea that you're not that this transform could warp the input space in any which way, and so there are no assurances of symmetry of any kind on the output. Is the function one one necessarily, or it need not be? Meaning? Uh, like, does one value map to a fixed value on uh, on the manifold, or that need yes. not be? Oh, here we just it's 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 a uh, here we're assuming the point is this: when you start when you start off with uh, you could you could go down in dimensions. You can't uh, uh, so uh, uh, if you start off with a k-dimensional input and you warp it through a function which produces say some d-dimensional output, mm -hmm. then the then the k-dimensional input manifold is going to be end up being a surface in the d-dimensional space whose inherent you know the manifold dimension is k or less. Right. Okay. You can actually be less than k. Right. Yeah. And then finally, you add some uncorrelated Gaussian first to account for half manifold variations, which will give you this guy. So you understand this model, right? Yeah. It's yes. very straightforward. And so this is our nonlinear Gaussian model. You have this function f of z, which is a nonlinear function that that takes in the input space and produces a curved manifold, like the decoder of the uh, like the deep like the right Gaussian. This should have been uh, yeah. Like remember, we spoke of nonlinear autoencoders several lectures ago. So this is rather like that. Now the samples of Z are placed on this curved manifold, and the actual data are produced by adding noise to samples on the manifold. So overall, here's what happens. This what does this function f do? The function f takes this sheet, this gray sheet. Forget about the circles. Uh, in which is which represents the k-dimensional input space. And the input space is just a plane, you know. Okay, it's 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 a, a linear space, and then it warps it and folds it and puts and places it in a higher dimensional space. And now in the higher dimensional space, thanks to this function f, it's no longer going to be a plane. It can be anything like this, like this curved humpy shape over here. And then you have samples drawn. If you have samples drawn from this input space, which are isotropically distributed, so distributed according to a Gaussian, which is uh, which, uh, which is an uncorrelated Gaussian with equal variance in every direction. Uh, the figure over here shows a uh, topological map, uh, equal probability contours for a Gaussian of that kind. They would be spheroidal. If you drew samples from that and place them on this plane, you're going to get some distribution of data on the plane. Now, the uh, for if the function f is sufficiently smooth, then you're going to get some kind of correspondence between the distribution here and the distribution here. Uh, high density values of z will locally correspond to high density values of x hat on this plane, and low density values will correspond locally to low density values of x hat under if f of z is well behaved. And so if I just take a scatter of data on the space, it's going to end up with a, as a, as a scatter of data on this curved manifold. And then finally, I'm going to add noise to it. So the nonlinear function warps the input space into a curved manifold in the data space. Samples drawn from x are placed on this manifold. And the distribution of x hat is going to sort of follow the distribution of x to some extent. And the final observations are added by adding uncorrelated full dimensional Gaussian noise to the sample. So uh, here is the generating process. If I want to think of this whole thing as a generative process, the first step, I draw some sample from here, from my input space, which might be this black dot, which is at this location of the Gaussian, right? I'm going to transform this point, this point through function f. It's going to place it on the plane, like here. And then as a second step, I'm going to draw this noise from, from this distribution, and I'm going to add it to this point, which takes it to this new point here, which is off the curved manifold. That's the entire generating process. So this function 
This model, it turns out, can actually model very complicated distributions. It all depends uh, just so long as this function f can capture the shape of the underlying manifold. So any kind of distribution which can be thought of as lying close to some curved k-dimensional manifold, or even a linear surface for that matter, because f of z equals az is a special case, uh, and can be captured by this model. The key requirements over here is that if you want to model things in this manner, you need to have a good idea of what the dimensionality of this manifold itself is. How did we know that in this space, in this example, for example, in this three-dimensional space, the data lie close to a, a two-dimensional curved surface and not a one-dimensional curved line. And that, so you need to know, have some idea of the dimensionality of the manifold and you need to have a function f that can transform this space onto the desired k-dimensional manifold in the data space. So the designing of this model has, a, has two key components, select or guess the dimensionality of this manifold itself, which is the dimensionality of the input space, and choosing the right function that can curve this, which can transform this linear input space into this curved manifold of the correct shape in the data space. This function should have the ability to transform things in this manner and such that it can, it can uh, uh, curve the input, input space into whatever shape the, that, that it is that best matches the distribution of the data that you're trying to learn the distribution of. And so if you want this function to be sufficiently flexible, you want something that's a universal approximator, which is why we will choose a neural network. So the pro problem of learning this distribution model then becomes this, you're given a collection of training data X, and our job becomes that of estimating the parameters of this function F, which warps the space, and the covariance of the off-surface noise, D. Again, this, is, this model is actually a generative model that models a distribution, which says that the output, the distribution of the output of your data looks very similar to the distribution of X that could be generated in this manner when Gaussian data are put, those are put through this transform and then uncorrelated noise are added to it. So this is actually a generative model. And to the parameters of this model are theta and d. And in order to make this model match the actual distribution of the data that you've got best, you have to estimate d and theta. And we can, and because this is a probabilistic probability model, we can use maximum likelihood estimation to learn its parameters. Questions? Anyone? No. Okay, so this guy over here shows you the distribution, at least the way I I tried to produce the uh, computed for this guy, for, for, the, for this scatter. So you can see the peak probabilities are right on this curve. And then as you go away, the probabilities fall off. So again, the estimation process is clearly going to be very similar to the linear Gaussian model. I'm assuming you understood the linear Gaussian model by this point. So going from the linear Gaussian model to this, this model is gonna be fairly straightforward. The conditional probability of X given Z is simply a Gaussian where this zero is replaced by F of Z. Because if, if I'm given Z, X is simply F of Z plus C, but this guy is fixed because Z has been given. So all I'm doing is I'm drawing noise, uh, noise from this distribution and adding F of Z to it. And so the result is going to be a Gaussian distribution with a mean at, mean at F of Z and the covariance d. Now the probability of x itself is going to be, the, the marginal probability of x is going to be uh, p of x given z times p of z with z being marginalized out, which is the product of this Gaussian, the conditional probability of x given z, and the second Gaussian, which, which is the, uh, there should have been i, the probability of z itself, 
the whole thing integrated with over z this formula is so broken this should this should have been c i'll fix it now the problem is this formula this because you have this ugly f of z inside the gaussian which parameterizes the mean of the gaussian this function formula is not tractable and in general you cannot get a closed form of p of for p of x although that won't really prevent us from being able to estimate the parameters of the model so again as before the if you want to estimate the parameters of the model the drawing of any observation is a two-step process first you draw z then you pass it through f then you add a noise so the complete data used to describe the, com the complete data I used to describe the, the full complete process of drawing any observation includes both no, includes both z and x so a complete specification of the uh, process that the drawing process for any observation should give you both z and x actually again z x and e but we can ignore it as i mentioned earlier and so if you had the complete data where for every observation x you had the corresponding z then learning the parameters of this model is not that difficult so again uh, i'm going to assume let's begin by considering the glass box process where you have a complete the complete data you have the z that generates any given observation and the x so you're given the x and the z and using this collection of complete data we're going to try to derive the estimation rule for the model parameters we can do that using maximum likelihood as before right so because you have the complete data you're going to be maximizing the sum over all complete observations of the log of the probability of the complete observation which is the joint of x and z and once again, you can factor P of X and Z as P of X given Z times PZ. PZ is just the standard Gaussian and not a function of either D or theta, so you can ignore it. So this just becomes the, uh, uh, the term that you're trying to maximize just becomes this guy, the sum over all complete observations of the log of the probability of the, of conditional probability of X given Z. P of X given Z was just this Gaussian over here, which is a Gaussian with covariance D and the mean at F of Z. So I can write out this formula and the overall objective that I must optimize is given by this nice little, uh, uh, nice little quadratic formula at the bottom. Now, although it looks quadratic, inside the quadratic is this F of z so it's x minus f of z which and f of z can be quite non-linear times d inverse times x minus f of z so this is still an ugly equation nevertheless it's nice enough that uh, you should be able to learn the parameters theta using back propagation back propagation uh, or gradient descent or since f of z is a neural network we'll call it back propagation the loss that you would minimize to train the parameters is simply going to be the negative of this log likelihood. You're maximizing the log likelihood, so you would minimize the negative log likelihood, which ends up being this guy over here, which is simply the negative of this term inside. And uh, you can train the parameters theta using backprop, and also the, the uh, uh, covariance of the noise itself by just this simple minimization. Now, this is what would happen if you had actually observed the Z for every X. Unfortunately, we don't have Z. It's missing. The observations are incomplete. So what do we do? We know this. We could estimate the model parameters if Z were known for every data observation. That is, if the data were complete, Unfortunately, we don't know Z, the data are incomplete. So we're going to use EA. We will complete the data. We're going to sort of fill in all of these missing values and then use the missing values to uh, use the complete data to estimate our model parameters using this nice little formula over here. Now, again, 
there are a couple of different ways of uh, of completing the data. First one, I can complete, I can fill in the Z using every possible value of Z. And each value of Z is going to occur in proportion to P of Z given X. The second one is instead of filling in the Z and using every possible value of Z, I can simply draw from the posterior probability of Z given X. And there's one final caveat over here of these two options. The first option is always a, a nicer option because you're considering every possible value. And, uh, the, and the second one is a little noisier because this actually ends up being somewhat of a Monte Carlo estimate, which is always noisier than, than considering all possible options. So where possible, where this will lead to nice closed form solutions, we should follow this approach. Where closed form solutions are kind of not going to be possible. We then they, we would follow the second approach of explicitly drawing samples. So in either case, we have this issue. We need this posterior probability P of Z given X. And the posterior probability P of Z given X is given by P of X given Z times P Z divided by P of X. This denominator P of X, we saw earlier, again, this formula needs to be fixed. This is an integral over Z. This is intractable because of this f of z over here, which means that uh, the denominator term that is required to compute the posterior probability cannot be computed. And as a consequence, the posterior probability, p of z given x, ends up becoming intractable, which means that because you can't really characterize p of z given x, you cannot integrate over it or draw samples from it. So what we will do is to try to approximate it. Questions, guys? No. no. Right. So did this bit make sense? Yeah. Right. What was up? So option one was uh, doing e EM over all of the data or all of the Important. All of the possibilities, every single way of every single value of x that is z that you have, you would consider. Okay. All infinity, all infinite values, right? Mm -hmm. Option two, you just draw values. Yeah. Either way, you're just completing the data, right? You would only do this if, you know, this is going to be give you, if you actually explicitly did it, you're going to get many infinities of data. And obviously, that doesn't make sense. But if you can sort of rework the arithmetic so that considering every possible uh, value of z can be collapsed into nice closed form formulae like we did for the linear case, you would follow option one. If that were not possible, then you just explicitly a sample from P of z given x, complete the data, and then estimate your model parameters from the completed data. So is, is option one does not generally feasible with like a, a super complex uh, model? We will see that, right? In a minute, right? Very often not, very often not. But in this case, and it turns out even for this model, we are going to use a hybrid where we're going to use both option one and option two. And we'll see why, okay? First, P of Z given X is intractable, just a little bit, right? So what we are going to do is to approximate P of Z given X. We're going to assume that P of Z given X can be well approximated by a Gaussian whose mean and variance are functions of X. And remember, we said that maximizing the elbow is going to maximize the likelihood of the data, but that only R is, is gives, ha, Maximizing the elbow could maximize the likelihood of the data, but that only works if the uh, function Q that you use to construct the elbow is as close as possible to P of Z given X, right? So keeping main, in keeping with that principle, we're going to try to find this guy, Q of Z given X, that is as close as possible to P of Z given X. And then we will use the Q of that Q to fill out these missing values. And that's because the PZ, PZ given X by itself ended up being intractable. So we'll make a couple of assumptions. 
we are going to assume that this approximate uh, distribution is Gaussian, whose mean and now mean and variance are functions of x. Clearly, right? Because this is p of z given x. It must be a function of x. Secondly, just for convenience, although this is not required, we are going to assume that this covariance matrix z is a diagonal covariance matrix. That this is a uh, that the components of uh, of of z uh, are uncorrelated to one another once x is given. It's not a very good assumption, but it works. And then once you compute q of x that approximates p of z given x as closely as possible, I can use q of z x as a, my proxy for p of z given x and run the formula and run my estimation. So here is what my EM estimation would look like. I would initialize my function f. Then in the first step, I'm going to estimate the p of this, this mu and sigma such that q approximates the posterior probability of z given x as closely as possible. Then I'm going to complete the data using q of z given x. And then once I have completed the data, I already have, uh, I know how to re-estimate the parameters of f of z using the complete data. So this is what I'm going to do, right? So here is the overall process. Uh, I'm going to initialize this theta, but I'm actually, actually also going to initialize the parameters of this approximator, the posterior approximator below. I will in fact begin by first sampling my z's from this guy, thereby completing the data. Now I have complete data. I'm going to go ahead and re-estimate my theta from the completed data. Then using this completed data, I have both sample z and x, right? I'm going to go back and fix this time, these guys such that this lower, this, this lower part of the, the components in the lower part of the figure better approximate the posterior of z given x. I can keep iterating this process until it converges. And since this is effectively EM, I'll eventually, uh, I expect to see the likelihood, log likelihood continuously increase until, uh, and what I finally get is going to give me a function f, which is a good generator for my data. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Very straightforward. So now let's go through the steps, the three steps. First step is, assuming I've initialized theta and z, the first step is I'm going to be sampling all of the missing information from this Gaussian here, which approximates my posterior, posterior of z given x. What exactly is the sampling? Now, I'm sampling data from a Gaussian who, which with some mean and variance. There's a very standard procedure for sampling data from a Gaussian of this kind. What you would do is to use what is called a reparameterization trick, which is very common. You would start off by sampling data from a zero mean unit variance Gaussian, and then multiply that sample by the standard deviation of your data, which is the square root of this guy and then add the mean, which is the noise. So when you do this, what you're really doing is uh, this. Let's say this is the Gaussian you want to sample from, and these are your coordinate axes. You would first sample from this guy, which is the zero mean unit variance. And then you'd multiply the data by the standard deviation, which is the square root of this one, which is going to convert it to this shape. And then you're going to add the noise, add the mean, which shifts everything to this location, right? So this is standard. And this is basically what we're going to do. For each training instance X, you're going to compute the mean and the variance using your approximation uh, function. Then you're going to draw some samples from this Gaussian, which is, uh, a Gaussian with mean mu, which is a function of x, and variance sigma, which is a function of x. And these approximation functions themselves, they are, they are, they are approximators, they will have parameters that must be optimized, right? So I'm going to call this parameters phi. And so to draw these samples, 
at each time I draw sample from a standard Gaussian multiplied by the standard deviation and add the add the mean. So what is the consequence of this? The sample that you draw at any time ends up being a function of phi because you're drawing this epsilon from a from a uh, from a standard Gaussian, but then you're multiplying it by the by the standard deviation, which is a function of phi, and then adding the mean, which is a function of phi, and also of x. So the z is in fact a sample of function of both x and phi. Make sense, guys? Yep. Yep. And so that means I can compute the derivative of z with respect to phi. The derivative of z with respect to phi just following this formula is simply going to be the derivative of the mean with respect to phi plus a diagonal matrix with that with epsilon in its diagonal terms times the or this should have been a derivative i'll fix this a bunch of errors the derivative of sigma with respect to phi so that gives me the derivative of z with respect to phi actually i can actually compute this term so now let's go on so i know how to draw the samples from the from this approximate posterior. Second, given these samples, how do I compute the uh, parameters theta? I'm going to assume that I've actually drawn some collection of samples which complete the data. So uh, again, we saw earlier that if I have the completions, then I actually have the then there's a fairly straightforward formula that uh, minimization that that I can perform that to to estimate the parameters of my of my function f. So this is fairly straightforward. And typically, one also makes an additional assumption. If a, a standard assumption here is that this noise, the the not only is the covariance matrix of this noise a diagonal matrix, we will also assume that all of the diagonal entries are identical with some value sigma squared, in which in which case this ugly matrix formula simply ends up becoming somewhat simpler, which is, uh, yeah, yeah, let's start some mistakes, there's no 0.5, uh, which is simply uh, d log sigma squared, d is the dimension of the data, log sigma squared plus, oh, there's too many mistakes, I'll fix these, plus sum uh, plus the, squared norm of x minus f and this can be this can be optimized with respect to theta and sigma squared so this is what you do if you had complete data right so we know how to do this assuming that you sample the z's from this distribution and completed each training instances where each training instance could be completed multiple times then you have complete data and from complete data you can re-estimate the theta that leaves us with the last bit. How do I estimate these parameters such that the probability distribution, this, the, the, the Gaussian probability distribution encoded by this part of the, part of the diagram uh, closely matches the posterior probability of Z given X. So again, we were approximating P of Z given X using this function Q of ZX, which was just this Gaussian. And we want these two guys to be as close as possible. So you're going to estimate these parameters phi such that the error between this Q and the posterior is minimized. And the way we'll do it, we define a divergence between these two guys and we minimize it with respect to phi. And if you go through the papers on uh, variational autoencoders, here's what they do. They say, let me define a callback library divergence between Q and P then uh, I can, the conditional probability of z given x can be written as p of z times p of x given z divided by p of x. So this means that uh, this divergence ends up be becoming the expectation over all z values drawn from q of the log of qzx minus the same thing of the log of p of z minus the same expectation of the log of p of x given z and so on. You work your way all the way down you end up with the callback Leibler divergence between Q of Zx 
and the uh, the prior probability p of z minus the expectation over this is sometimes missing here of the log of the conditional probability of x given z i don't know about you guys but this math exactly how much intuition do you get out of this math anyone not not super intuitive but no. there is yeah. there is some uh... Uh, okay let's go back and look at it slightly better right okay. let's try that again so here's what i'm going to do i'm going to assume that i have the completed i have completed the data right and I've completed the Z's using Q of ZX. Now we have a collection of XZ pairs. To be more precise, you really want to write XZ subscript XJ because the Z that you sample is from a distribution that's specific to X and, you can, and you're going to have many samples of Z for each X because you're completing each X in many different ways, right? So although I'm writing XZ pairs, you have to consider, remember that the Z's are specific to X, and then you can have and you can have many such pairs with the same X, right? And now I'm going to continue using the shorthand XZ. But once we agree upon that, I have a collection of completed data. I'm going to work with the complete data. So if I have the complete data, then the posterior probability of z given x on the complete data. Again, you're assuming all of these vectors are independent of one another. It's just going to be the product over all of the individual vectors of the posterior probability of z given x for each x, right? And so the log of the posterior probability of z given x is simply going to be the sum over all complete vectors of the log of the posterior probability of the individual z given the corresponding x, right? This is the actual posterior probability of the data according to the model f. But then if you consider the approximation given by the lower guy, this is, if you look at the approximate posterior probabilities of all of the z's given all of the x's, Again, due to independence, I could multiply the posteriors, approximate posteriors over the individual observations. And uh, so it's, good that it's going to be the product over all of the individual complete vectors of Q of Zx. And, if I, and so the log of the posterior probabilities of all of these Zs given all of these Xs is going to be the sum over all complete vectors of, there's a log again, the log of Q of Z, Zx for the individual vectors. Lots of errors on these slides, I must fix them. So all we are going to do is I want, at least on my completed data, which I've already drawn. Remember the first step over here, right? If you go back several, several slides, the first step was kind of a sampling, right? Of drawing. Now, so, uh, what I want to do is that on my complete set, on my uh, complete data, I want to estimate the phi such that the error between the log posterior of z given x given by my approximator and the actual posterior probability of z given x is minimized. That's it. Make sense? Yeah. That's All right. So, that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to say, I'm going to minimize log of Q minus log of PZ given X, which is a sum over all complete vectors of this should have been a log again, log of QZX minus log of PZ given X. I'm missing so many logs. I had fixed these errors. What happened? My slides didn't get copied over. I hate it. Anyways, so just expanding this guy, we're using Bayes rule, right? This is going to be log of Q. Let me write this. I'll fix the slides and put them up. This is going to be log of Q minus minus 
log of p minus log of p of x given z plus log of p of x, right? This is the conditional probability of the observation given z. And observe that the function phi, the, the variable phi influences at q. And because the z values that we, are, that we are considering over here are drawn from q of z, uh, from q, so the and phi affects q, it also affects these z's. So this term is also a function of phi. And again, because z is involved over here, this term too is a function of phi. This guy doesn't have either phi or z in it. It's not a function of phi. And so this can be ignored. And so this gives me this loss function. Ah, here I actually managed to put in the logs. So this is this gives me this log function, which is only considering the useful portions of this, this, this error over here, which is the sum over all complete data vectors of the log of the complete data vector as uh, of the log of the, uh, the approximate probability of z given x as computed using q minus the log of the probability assigned to z by the pri a priori probability function p, right? Minus this term over here, which is the conditional probability of z given, x given z. So this makes sense, right? Yep. This is what I'm going to minimize with respect to phi. And then here, here's the question. This summation is over the complete data, right? How do we complete the data? So I've, I've written the formula again over here. The formula sums over complete data. So the, so the question is, how do you compute this? What is it you're sum, summing over? How exactly did you com, complete the data? Now, the first step of the algorithm that we did, that we wrote down, in the first step, we sampled the Z, right? Or uh, because we had an initial guess for Q, we just sampled the Z from, from uh, that initial guess. You can simply choose those samples that you have already drawn, in which case you know exactly what this formula is, no big deal. And you can skip the next few slides in my lecture. And you can compute the derivative of this log, of this loss with respect to both uh, with respect to phi, which is simply going to be the uh, derivative of this guy with respect to phi, plus the derivative of this guy with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to phi. Again, remember, you've already seen how to compute the derivative of z with respect to phi, minus the derivative of the log of p of z with respect to z times the derivative of z with respect to phi, minus the log of p of x given z, derivative of the log of p of x given z with respect to z times the log of, times the derivative of z with respect to phi. So if you just want to simply use the samples that you've already drawn, you could simply find, you could simply find the derivative of this loss function here, where the loss function sums these guys over the complete vectors obtained from the samples. You get a derivative, you can use this derivative to optimize the uh, the phi, but then you can try to be more, more, more precise. Remember, we had two options. Consider every possible value of z or drawing some samples from p of z given x. And we said wherever it was possible to get a closed form solution, you want to use option one, you use option two, only when that's not feasible, correct? So I'm going to partition this guy over here, this loss function into two sets. These first two terms, it turns out that I can actually compute this, I can compute this guy over all possible values of z in closed form. It's only the second term that doesn't, that becomes intractable and where I cannot compute this over all possible values of z. So it turns out that the proportion underlined in blue can be computed in closed form if you consider every possible value of z. The portion underlined in red cannot. So I'm going to separately sum these guys over all possible values of z 
and these guys are only the samples drawn from Q. Does it make sense? This is because theta is intractable, right? The function over theta is intractable. Because the function over theta is intractable. Yeah, that makes sense. Correct. And so, when I compute this first term over all possible values of Z, that's in, and again, the samples are being drawn from Q, right? This just means that I'm going to be multiplying this difference by Q, which remember was just a posterior. This is the, this is the distribution I'm, I'm, uh, I'm generating the Z's from, and I'm integrating this over all possible values of Z, right? So for every X, I'm considering all possible values of Z for the first term. For the second term, I'm only explicitly cons explicitly considering the samples that I actually drew. Make sense? Yes. Right, Chris, make sense? Yep. Okay, so this first term is simply the callback library di divergence between Q and P. And so I can write the entire loss in this manner, where the first term is the sum over all observations of the callback Leibler divergence between Q of Z and X, computed for that X, and P of Z, which is the, which is the uh, standard Gaussian prior probability distribution for Z. The second term, of course, is the sum over all of the complete observations of the log of the conditional probability of X given Z. And of course, this Q we know is a Gaussian. So if you work your way through the arithmetic, it turns out that uh, the callback Leibler divergence between two Gaussians is given by this formula over here. We're not going to derive it or make sense of it. It's actually fairly straightforward to derive this formula, particularly when P of Z is a, is a uh, standard Gaussian, zero mean unit variance Gaussian. Now log of P of X given Z, again, this term we have derived earlier. Right? And so the overall loss function is going to be the sum of this callback Leibler divergence minus the second term, which all these minuses become pluses. So you end up with this guy over here. And so you end up with a loss function, which is a function of Z and X, which is a function of phi. But then if you really want to compute the derivative, this first term has no Z's in it. So I can simply, uh, compute the derivative of this guy. Wait, hang on. I'm going to make one more simplification. We assume that the noise that is added to the, if you assume that the noise that is added to the output of the, uh, of the uh, uh, generator the samples. has a diagonal covariance matrix where all the diagonal terms are constant then this D actually ends up becoming, this, this, this D over here actually ends up becoming just a diagonal matrix with a constant term along the diagonal. Secondly, this term is not a function of phi, so you can ignore it. All of these halves, they are just constants that you can ignore it. So when you ignore the, if you ignore this first term and the halves, you end up with this slightly simplified loss function. And then furthermore, if you assume that D is a diagonal matrix whose terms are all sigma squared, then this guy just becomes a squared norm. There should be a sigma squared over here that again, I'm missing so many times, I'll fix that, right? So you end up, you end up with this loss function, which is quite simplified, which is the callback Leibler divergence. Plus- is, does, the second, does the second term have any reliance on phi's though? Just in Z, right? Yeah, so here we go, right? When I compute the derivative of the second term with respect to phi, yeah. you're going to, this one is directly a derivative with respect to phi. This is going to be a derivative with respect to Z times the derivative of Z with respect to phi, right? Yep. And so here is my complete algorithm. There are lots of math mistakes. I'll fix these on the slides before I post it. I'm going to initialize my theta and my phi. I'm going to sample my z's from this approximator, posterior approximator. I'm going to use the sample z's to complete the data and compute, and, and compute a loss, which I can use to 
find the parameters of theta and and d then subsequently i'm going to i'm going to define this loss also computed on the completed data which consists of, which consists of two terms and i'm going to find the fun parameters phi to minimize the second loss and then once i've done that i have a new uh, posterior approximator that i can go back and generate a fresh bunch of samples from use those to find my theta and then go down and use that theta to compute my phi again and i can keep iterating the process so once i've trained it the approximation function q on z below can be discarded the rest of the function is what is the generative model for x generating data using this part of the model should ideally give us data similar to the training data right so again where are the neural networks pretty much everything here is a neural network f of z we generally model it by a neural network because you want to be able to you want a function that can capture arbitrary manifolds and mu and sigma are also modeled by the neural networks except the standard approach is to have a common neural network with two outputs one for mu and one for sigma it's not necessary it simplifies the number of parameters or uh, specifically because you know the mu and sigma are obviously related so this kind of structure makes sense but the concept is the figure to the right and so here is the overall network as it's usually implemented you have the portion that generates observations from these sample z's is what we will call a decoder the portion that computes the approximate the parameters of the approximate posterior or z is what we'll call the encoder so the decoder is the generative model the encoder is primarily needed for training but you can also use it to get an approximate posterior probability distribution for the latent space representations of the inputs and z of course as in the case of the linear gaussian model or in the case of pca is simply a latent latent space representation of the data and this mu you can think of it as the expected latent representation of x now vaes are strictly generative models unlike the go back to that last slide yeah it's usually implemented with the reparameterization trick, right? Not which one? Not direct samples. There are the reparameterization is here. It's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just not visualized, I guess. No, tell me, tell me this. Where is the reparameterization over here? It's this guy. See that? Mm -hmm. Everything is already accounted for. There are no more tricks. It just visually, visually in that graph that you had, it's not super clear. So in this case, uh, there is there, there is no reparameterization re per se once your network is trained, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and the only place where reparameterization occurs is when you're sampling Z. Yeah. And there's no reparameterization trick per se. The only way to generate data we know to generate data from uh, from or not the only way maybe but the call usual technique to get to technique to generate data from an arbitrary gaussian is to generate it from a standard gaussian scale it and shift it that is the common way so the process of generating z just sort of if you go back all those slides right the process of generating z always uh, uses reparameterization that's how the z's are generated which is why you get this formula for z which is why you can compute the derivative of z with respect to phi make sense yeah yeah so there are no there are no no tricks there's nothing fancy there's nothing particularly complicated about any of this it looks tedious but it's really very simple there's nothing fancy nothing no crazy new trick for you to learn none Okay. Yes. So, Advait makes sense. Yes, it's clear. Yeah. So the problem here is that this is a generative model. You can use it to generate samples of data. You know, I put in a Gaussian random 
you know, a Z from a uniform Gaussian, whatever comes out, you can expect it to look like the data that you used to train and train the model with. If this came from a different distribution, that guarantee no longer holds. Uh, but you cannot use it to compute the likelihood of a data. If I give you some X and say, what is the probability that this X was generated by the same distribution that my training data came from, there is no formula here which actually gives you that value. This is strictly generative. It only generates samples. And that is because P of X itself as given by this formula is intractable. So uh, you can sort of come up with extensions of the model which tries to get this guy, but in this form, it's intractable. So uh, it's not really a likelihood compute, useful for computing likelihoods. However, the model is very effective as, as a generator and you can learn highly complex distributions. And you, you must have seen all of these examples in the various literature. So this one is Carl Dorsch's from Carl Dorsch's paper where uh, they trained a VAE from uh, MNIST. And then when you generate it, you feed the, the decoder random. When you use this, the VAE to generate data, what comes out ends up looking somewhat like digits. Or here there was a VAE trained on faces and then when you use that VAE to generate to randomly generate data, it produces things like faces, which means that it has actually learned the face manifold in this high dimensional space. And it's, it is uh, producing samples from this face manifold. Now there's one, there are a couple of tricks over here. Firstly, when I generate, if I use this in a generative way, the common, uh, uh, the, what one normally does is to not add any noise once one go, well, once you get a sample from that has been output by F. And not adding noise is like saying, I'm, compu I'm computing the expected value of Z, X given Z. Oh, okay. Right? So you're always producing the expected value rather than an actual sample from the data. This is the, uh, simply because you assume that the expected value is a more reliable indicator. Uh, but that sort of beats the generative aspect of it somewhat. Nevertheless, it kind of works. So another thing is that the latent space Z, Z actually is supposed to capture the underlying structure in the data in a, in a smooth manner, just like in the case of PCA or in the case of the linear Gaussian models. And so varying Z continuously in different directions over here should give you plausible variations in the drawn output. And so typically what would, do, so let's say you want to manipulate some input and if the model has learned some structure in it, then I could compute a posterior probability of Z and I various samples of Z around the mean of this posterior probability should give you plausible variations of the X itself. And that is, that is the, uh, the uh, uh, the procedure that was used to generate this particular example below where they start off with this face, they get a posterior probability for Z, then they sort of manipulate Z around that, uh, around the mean and moving in different directions gives you different uh, expressions. Now, if you actually implement this and try to get such cute pictures, you're not, you're, you're going to be out of luck. Uh, these things are kind of cherry picked. If you run it a thousand times, some of them will look very really nice. So now, so in conclusion, the variational autoencoders are simple nonlinear extensions of linear Gaussian models. There's nothing fancy about them. The arithmetic used to learn VAEs is also just a simple nonlinear extension of the arithmetic used to learn linear Gaussian models. They tend to be excellent generative models of the distributions of data, uh, but they're not good for computing likelihoods. There are various extensions like conditional VAEs, which model conditional distributions. Now again, modeling a distribution and modeling a conditional distribution are not very different. It's still the same thing. Now it's going to be a generative model which takes as input, not merely the Z, but also the conditioning variable Z, Y. And so both the encoder and the decoder would have to consider what it was it. Uh, there have been other extensions where instead of, I mean, instead of having Z be a simple Gaussian 
you try other variants on Z, like making it a mixture. Or uh, so uh, you'll observe that we have this entire generative structure we, that we keep assuming, where, where we keep assuming Z is Gaussian. That's mostly a tractability issue. Once you begin putting things on nonlinear manifolds and put skew things through ugly transformations like the function F, what comes out is no longer Gaussian, right? So uh, uh, that means you can sort of relax the assumption of Gaussianity on Z itself and choose other variants. And there, there has been some work on that. In all cases, the arithmetic for learning the model is very similar to what I've presented over here. And you could literally just work it out. And uh, I recommend to the students they actually that they actually read up the literature on this topic, which is not vast but vast. So thank you. Any questions, guys? No, it's clear. Thank you.